Welcome to Real Planning, where we look at construction projects from famous movies and analyze how they might have actually been planned and scheduled. Let's go. The Great Escape tells the incredible true story about the men of Stalag Luft III who planned and carried out the biggest escape from a prison camp in history. How did they do it? Through ingenious and devious feats of engineering. If you were planning this project, how would you schedule it so that it got done as fast as possible while mitigating delays, planning for redundancies, and all the while keeping the whole thing secret and hidden from external forces? Let's find out. Since the start of the war, members of the British Royal Air Force were being shot down and captured above German territory. These prisoners of war, POWs, were not put in the hands of the German army, but of the German Air Force, the Luftwaffe. This was a plus, since both the Luftwaffe and RAF had mutual respect for each other. That being said, it was the unwritten rule of every Allied POW to do everything in their power to escape, and by 1943, these downed flyers had gotten very good at it. Not yet, stupid. After I get clear. Okay, maybe not that good, but so much so that it caused the Germans to build a brand new camp, Stalag Luft III. This camp was designed to hold all of the most notorious Allied escapees in one secure place. We have in effect put all our rotten eggs in one basket. And we intend to watch this basket carefully. What's really cool is that Wally Floody, one of the main tunnelers of the actual escape, was on set during the making of the film to ensure as much accuracy as possible. Uh, he wasn't consulted on that. Jokes aside, the movie is very accurate in how it portrays all the planning and tunneling in the camp itself leading up to the escape. Well, you speak for yourself, Colonel. Roger Bushell, or Big X, held a meeting with the heads of the escape committee in their new escape-proof camp. Boldly, he pitched his plan for the largest escape in history. You're crazy. You ought to be locked up. You too. 250 guys just walking down the road just like that. How would they do it? Before the war, a lot of these men were skilled craftsmen, engineers, electricians, and now they were all together in the same room. Roger proposed they would not just dig one large tunnel, but three, codenamed Tom, Dick, and Harry. Tom would start in hut 123 and head west, right under the wire and into the cover of the woods. Dick would start in 122, just behind Tom, and head out in the same direction. Harry would be dug under hut 104, and then head straight north under the front of the camp. Once all that was decided, construction activities could actually start being planned. Pretty straightforward. A100, B100, and C100 are the tunnel trap construction activities. Each tunnel needed a hidden entrance for obvious reasons. The three could be constructed simultaneously. Tom's trap was hidden under the floor in a dark corridor. The entrance for Harry was in the foundation under a hut stove, which they made a special curved piping for so they could keep it burning even while they moved it and were digging underneath, straight down into the foundation. The trap door for Dick was so ingenious, the escape committee declared that it would never be found. Never was. Hidden under a shower drain, they were able to keep water under the grate at all times when the entrance wasn't being used. After the trap entrance to each tunnel was constructed, the tunnel shafts, A, B, and C200, could then be excavated. However, these had finished to start relationships with each other. This is due to the fact that Wally Floody, the chief tunneler, would conduct the digging of each shaft himself. Roger Bushell made it clear that to avoid any worries about sound or surface interference, all three shafts would go straight down 30 feet before the tunnels began going out towards the wire. Surprisingly, this only took about 12 days of digging at which point, Floody could move on to excavating the next shaft, while the tunnel crew came in to perform A300, shaft finishing. Boards, scavenged from all over the camp would be used to frame the entire shaft down, and a ladder would be constructed. Not only that, 
but at the bottom of each shaft, a four-part chamber would be dug and reinforced. One chamber became the face of the tunnel. The chamber opposite acts as a little storeroom to hold the dirt before it can be taken up for dispersal. Another chamber holds supplies and equipment, and the last chamber is needed for the bellows operator. That's right, to ensure breathable air for the diggers, ventilation was created by having a makeshift bellows constantly operating at the bottom of the shaft. Air would be pumped through the piping all the way down the tunnel. Oh, I'll have it for you tomorrow, Roger. You're badly behind schedule, said you go, Cobb. How's it coming, Danny? Once each of the A, B, and C300 activities were completed, tunneling could commence immediately. Each tunnel was assigned a digging crew, 12 men working an eight-hour shift over the course of a day or night. The tunneling activity itself is essentially five different tasks happening simultaneously. If you break the activity down another level on the WBS, it would look like this. One man digs at the face of the tunnel, digging. His partner would lay behind him and scoop sand into bags, which would then be sent back down the tunnel, sand removal. As well, every few feet, the tunnel would need to be reinforced with wood supports, reinforcing. Tin pipes were installed along the floor of the tunnel for bellows airflow for the candlelights and tunnelers, piping. Lastly, a trolley track was constructed along the entirety of the tunnel so that materials and men could move down the tunnel swiftly, track laying. This would be essential for moving so many escapers through the tunnel, as well as aiding in the speed of the construction. Finally, E100, sand dispersal. The problem with digging a massive tunnel is all the sand you need to put somewhere. It was a different color and smell than the dirt on the campground surface. Now you could hide some of the sand in the walls of your barracks hut or under the floorboards, but obviously this has some severe limitations. Luckily, the men had come up with a brilliant solution. Using little sewn bags you could wear inside your pants, men of the dispersal crew could walk around the camp nonchalantly and, with their hands in their pockets, pull a string which would unpin the satchels, thus spreading the dirt out the bottom of their pants where it could be subtly and promptly blended into the dirt on the ground. With dozens of men doing this all throughout the day, sand dispersal was able to keep up with the amount of dirt being taken out of the tunnel. Now, as we saw from the map of the camp layout, each tunnel would have a different needed length to reach beyond the wire and into the safety of the tree line. Tom, which would start its shaft construction first, also needed the least amount of distance to travel to reach the woods. Dick runs a little extra distance from Hut 122. Harry would need to go the furthest, heading straight north out of the camp. This would mean that the first availability of escape through a finished tunnel, Tom, would be mid-August, and all tunnels should be completed and ready to use by the end of September. Now as you know, things in the construction world don't always, or ever, go exactly as planned. Especially not when your project is taking place secretly inside a POW camp where all activities have to be completely hidden from sight. 